Hello and welcome to Lifespan Development Psychology. My name is Matthew Poole and I'm an instructor of psychology at Northeast State Community College. And today we're going over Chapter 7, Adolescence. So let's look at some physical changes of adolescence, more particularly focused on the brain. So the prefrontal cortex, which is in your frontal lobe, as displayed to the uh, figure on the right, uh, is involved in decision making, problem solving, higher level cognition, judgment, etc. And you've got this myelination, myelination, excuse me, increases, which increases information processing speed, as well as synaptic pruning and strengthens the strongest neural connections. Then you've got your limbic system, which developed before the prefrontal cortex, because we know and we've discovered uh, the frontal lobe doesn't, con doesn't conclude development until about your mid-20s. And so within this limbic system, you have structures like the amygdala, the hippocampus, things like that. So it's uh, as we've discovered, the amygdala is involved in emotion processing, uh, as well as other areas of the brain involved in dopamine, um, rewards and punishment. So dopamine is that feel-good chemical, um, and the production is very high in adolescence. So it's involved in pleasure-seeking, uh, as well as risk-taking behaviors. Uh, on top of this, production of serotonin, the calming chemical involved in mood, bounces dopamine and extreme behaviors. And sleep is crucial for adolescents, it's crucial for everybody at each stage, but melatonin levels increase later in the night, making night owls versus early ri risers. And so teens, they need about 9 to 10 hours of sleep per night. But if you were to ask an adolescent how much sleep they actually get, it's probably significantly lower than that. And so deficits of sleep will promote uh, behavioral difficulties such as impulsivity and negative emotions. Now, health concerns during adolescence include a negative body image with body dissatisfaction, and it's associated with poor nutrition and atypical eating patterns. So uh, the onset of eating disorders may occur, which includes muscle disform dysmorphia, so obsessed with muscle development, bulimia, bulimia nervosa, binge purge cycles, uh, and often normal weight. You've got anorexia nervosa, which includes a distorted body image, underweight, and a low caloric intake, as well as binge eating disorder, overeating sprees often associated with anxiety, depression, and obesity. So the health consequences of eating disorders include, um, of course, with anorexia, the most, which is the most fatal mental disorder, uh, unfortunately, suicide is more common. Then you've got binge eating, which can lead to the onset of type 2 diabetes, obesity, high cholesterol, heart disease, and high blood pressure. And so some common treatments of eating disorders include cognitive behavioral therapy, medication, and of course, general counseling. And so parental involvement and monitoring is crucial. Now let's look at the cognitive development during adolescence. So uh, perspectives in, from uh, Piaget, including constructivist and information proce processing. So major improvements in thinking happen during adolescence with regard to attention, memory, processing speed, organization, and metacognition. So with attention, um, selective attention, divided attention may be a difficulty. Um, with memory, working memory, uh, as well as long-term memory improve. So working memory is your short-term memory. Processing speed increases and levels, it increases and levels off in adolescence. Uh, strategies and processes, mnemonic devices are utilized through, uh, with organization and metacognition, thinking about thinking and planning ahead. Now let's look at some social development during adolescence. So uh, we know through Eric Erickson, this is a stage where adolescents go through the identity versus role confusion phase. So they ask the, themselves, who am I and what do I want to be? Uh, so they may try out different roles, different identities to see what sticks with them. And if that identity is achieved, then this crisis is resolved. Otherwise, we may experience a role confusion of, well, who really am I and who really do I want to be? I don't know that. And so identity is continually developing rather than forming, okay? It's developing. 
and uh, they're working on the self-concept as well as self-esteem. So the self-concept includes like self-awareness based on beliefs, values, opinions, and thoughts, uh, possible and ideal selves. And then with self-esteem, there's no evidence of severe adolescent drop in self-esteem. It's uh, barometric, so self-esteem may fluctuate, okay? And it's based on the self-concept, uh, as previously discussed, and relationships. Now look, let's continue with this identity development. So gender identity, this is important to note, sex versus gender, because people will often convolute the two or, uh, in, in, uh, you know, think of it as the same. So your sex is your biologically is biologically assigned male versus female whereas gender uh, is dependent on the social situation social construct really is what I'm trying to say so how one identifies is, is their gender and so those who are considered cisgender they identify with their assigned sex as birth at birth as a gender and then transgender so uh, gender identity differs from sex assigned at birth so how one identifies is not congruent with their assigned sex from birth. Okay, and with gender expression, it's largely based on social expectations. So, masculine and feminine dimensions, uh, interactions, clothing, and behaviors, and then uh, that's different from one's sexual orientation. What with uh, the gender that one identifies is not congruent with um, how, who somebody is sexually attracted to. So, uh, like I said, separate from that gender identity and it denotes emotional uh, and sexual attraction. So let's talk about some social changes. So there's this shift, uh, continual shift, uh, which starts in middle childhood from parents to peers. So uh, parent or peers are really influential during this stage. Um, and the parent-child relationship really changes. The, uh, they're given more autonomy and there's less of control, okay? And with peer relationships, there's this concept known as homophily, which is can be, for lack of better terms or lack of better phrases, is birth, uh, birds of a feather flock together. Peer pressure can be positive. It doesn't always have to be negative. You could be peer pressured in a very positive manner. Um, but deviant peer contagion is negative peer pressure. So there's definitely plenty of that out there uh, in order to fit in or oblige to a group. Uh, and adolescents definitely uh, during this stage have the tendency to not want to be rejected by the group and will engage in behaviors or engage in, um, yeah, engage in behaviors that they normally wouldn't otherwise. Okay. All right, let's talk about aggression and antisocial behavior. So you've got, with, according to Patterson, you've got early starters versus late starters. So early starters are more likely to persist long term, okay, maybe due to personal factors. Late starters, it's limited, it's a limited duration and usually uh, in adolescents only because of a lack of parental monitoring be, uh, becomes uh, salient and deviance ends when more alternative alternative options arise. Now, according to Moffitt, there's this life course persistent versus adolescent uh, limited. Life course persistent typically starts earlier and adolescent limited re, uh, is a result of a maturity gap. Okay. So anxiety and depression. Um, anxiety is the most common um, mental disorder uh, during uh, uh, this stage along with depression, uh, among the most common I should say. And Within the anxiety disorders section, specific phobias are the most common. Okay, so specific phobias include an intense anxiety or fear regarding a particular object, person, place, or thing. Okay, uh, then you've got major depression. Uh, genetics are involved in the onset of depression, but are definitely environmentally influenced. And approximately 15% or 1 in 5 girls and uh, 1 in uh, 10 boys experience major depression. Okay, so there's this unfortunate increased risk for suicide. And so with suicide, of course, there's the, the ideation phase, the distressing thoughts about killing oneself, or parasuicide, or attempted uh, slash failed suicide. So it's important to talk about this. 
I know this is on YouTube, so hopefully this verbiage does not get flagged because it's an important topic to uh, to discuss. And in class, we would have a healthy discussion, although it's a hard topic to uh, explore. It's absolutely necessary in, necessary in identifying potential uh, flags for suicide, such as withdrawal. Uh, of course, the ideation, which may be written or otherwise uh, recorded, things like that. Okay, so that's going to conclude this chapter of Lifespan Development Psychology. I will see you in Chapter 8. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.